Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. So uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, distinguished uh, keynote speaker. Jhumpa Lahiri is a professor of creative writing at the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University. She received a Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for her debut story collection, Interpreter of Maladies. Her follow-up novel, The Namesake, in 2003, was adapted for the screen in 2007. Her book of short stories, Unaccustomed Earth, which was being read uh, uh, by the woman next to me on the plane uh, uh, on a return trip uh, from Newark Airport, um, which was just about the only part of that trip that was uh, interesting to me, nothing against Newark. Um, uh, that received the 2008 Frank O'Connor International uh, Short Story Award. Uh, finally, her book, The Lowland, uh, Random House 2013, uh, also won the 2015 DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. Um, after reading uh, uh, her keynote, um, uh, 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 Jhumpa will be accompanied uh, in conversation by Celeste Ng, who is the internationally best-selling author of the novels Everything I Never Told You and Little Fires Everywhere. Um, she is a Harvard graduate and also has received her uh, MFA from the University of Michigan, and she has the coolest Twitter handle ever. Um, Jhumpa. Oh, no, no, they'll get, they have to guess. It's, it's pronounced ing, but I should have let you do that. Jhumpa Lahiri. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank everyone at Radcliffe for inviting me. I feel like I've been in this room before. Is that possible? Um, I think I might have been here um, when the namesake came out. And I, I believe I read here. Um, anyway, I feel very comfortable. That's a good thing. Um, I'm looking forward to my conversation with Celeste. Um, and as a point of departure, I'd like to read a, a short story that was published a couple of months ago in the New Yorker magazine. It's called The Boundary. This is a story I wrote uh, originally in Italian uh, three years ago when I was living in Rome. Um, and it was published in Italian in the uh, Italian version of Granta magazine, which sadly is no longer in print. Uh, last fall in Princeton, I decided to translate it myself into English, and this is the result. Uh, the, the title of the story in Italian is Il Confine, which is the word for boundary, a border, and so I chose the boundary as the English title. <clears throat> Every Saturday, a new family comes to stay. Some arrive early in the morning from afar, ready to begin their vacation. Others don't turn up until sunset in bad moods, maybe having lost their way. It's easy to get lost in these hills. The roads are poorly signposted. Today, after they introduced themselves, I show them around. My mother used to do the welcoming, but she's spending the summers in a nearby town, helping out an el elderly gentleman who's also on vacation, so I have to do it. As usual, there are four of them, mother, father, two daughters. They follow me, their eyes wide, happy to stretch their legs. We stop for a moment on the shaded patio that looks out over the lawn under a thatched roof that filters the light. There are two armchairs and a sofa covered with white fabric, lounge chairs for sunbathing, and a wooden table big enough for 10 people. I open the sliding glass door and show them inside, the cozy living room with two comfortable sofas in front of the fireplace, the well-stocked kitchen, two bedrooms, 
while the father unloads the car and the girls, who are probably around seven and nine, disappear into their room, shutting the door behind them, I tell the mother where to find extra towels and woolen blankets in case it gets cold at night. I show her where the mouse poison is hidden. Kill the flies before going to bed, I suggest. Otherwise, they start buzzing at dawn and become a nuisance. I explain how to get to the supermarket, how to use the washing machine behind the house, and where to hang the laundry just on the other side of my father's garden. Guests are free to pick lettuce and tomatoes, I add. There were lots of tomatoes this year, but most of them spoiled in the July rain. I, pretended not to, I pretend not to watch them, to be discreet. I do the housework and water the garden, but I can't help noticing how happy and excited they are. I hear the girls' voices as they run across the lawn. I learn their names. Since the guests usually leave the sliding door open, I overhear what the parents say to each other as they settle into the house, as they unpack their suitcases and decide to have what, what to have for lunch. The cottage where my family lives is a few yards away, behind a tall hedge that forms a kind of screen. For years, our house was just a room that served as both kitchen and bedroom for the three of us. Then, two years ago, when I turned 13, my mother started working for the elderly gentleman, and after saving up enough money, my parents asked the man who owns the property if they could add a small room for me. My father is the caretaker. He looks after the big house, chops the wood, works the fields and the vineyard. He looks after the horses, which the owner loves with a passion. The owner lives abroad, but he's not a foreigner like us. He comes every now and then on his own. He doesn't have a family. During the days, he goes horseback riding. In the evenings, he reads in front of the fireplace. Then he goes away again. Not many people rent his house other than in summer. The winters here are biting, and in spring, there's lots of rain. In the mornings from September to June, my father drives me to school where I feel out of place. I don't mix easily with others. I don't look like anyone else. The girls in this family resemble each other. You can tell right away that they're sisters. They've already put on matching bathing suits to go to the beach later on. The beach is about 15 miles from here. The mother looks like a girl, too. She's small and thin. She wears her, hair long, her long hair loose. Her shoulders are delicate. She walks barefoot on the grass, even though the father tells her not to, saying, and he's right, that there might be porcupines, hornets, snakes. After a few hours, it's as if they've always lived here. The things they've brought for a week in the country are scattered all over the place. Books, magazines, a laptop, computer, dolls, hoodies, colored pencils, pads of paper, flip-flops, sunscreen. At lunch, I hear forks striking plates. I notice each time one of them sets down a glass on the table. I detect the calm thread of their conversation, the sound and smell of the coffee pot, smoke from a cigarette. After lunch, the father asks one of the girls to bring him his glasses. For a long time, he studies a road map. He lists small towns to visit nearby, archaeological sites, ruins. The mother isn't interested. She says, this is her only week of the year without appointments and obligations. Later on, the father heads off to the sea with his daughters. He asks me as they're leaving how long it takes to get there, which of the beaches is nicest. He asks me about the weather forecast for the week, and I tell him there's a heat wave coming. The mother stays home. She's put on her bathing suit anyway to get some sun. She stretches out on one of the lounge chairs. I assume she's going to take a nap, but when I go to hang up the wash, I see her writing something. She writes by hand in a little notebook resting on her thighs. Now and then she lifts her head and looks intently at the landscape that surrounds us. She stares at the various greens of the lawn, the hills, the woods in the distance, the glaring blue of the sky, the yellow hay, the bleached fence and the low stone wall that marks the property line. She studies everything I look at every day, but I wonder what else she sees in it. When the sun starts to go down, they put on sweaters and long pants to shield themselves from mosquitoes. The father and the girls have wet hair from the hot showers they took after the beach. The girls tell their mother about their trip, the burning sand, the slight murky water, the slightly murky water, the gentle disappointing waves. 
The whole family goes for a short walk. They go to look at the horses, the donkeys, a wild boar kept in a pen behind the stables. They go to see the flock of sheep that passes in front of the house every day around this time, locking for a few minutes the cars on the dusty road. The father keeps taking pictures with his cell phone. He shows the girls the small plum trees, the fig trees, the olives. He says, fruit picked straight from the tree tastes different because it smells of the sun, the countryside. Parents open a bottle of wine on the patio. They taste some cheese, the local honey. They admire the blazing landscape and marvel at the huge glowing clouds, the color of pomegranates in October. Evening falls. They hear frogs, crickets, the rustle of the wind. In spite of the breeze, they decide to eat outside to take advantage of the lingering light. My father and I eat inside, in silence. He doesn't look up when he eats. With my mother away, there's no conversation during dinner. She's the one who talks at meals. My mother can't stand this place. Like my father, she comes from much farther away than anyone who vacations here. She hates living in this country, in the middle of nowhere. She says that the people here aren't nice, that they're closed. I don't miss her complaining. I don't like listening to her, even though she's probably right. Sometimes when she complains too much, my father sleeps in the car instead of in bed with her. After dinner, the girls wander around the lawn following fireflies. They play with their flashlights. The parents sit on the patio contemplating the starry sky, the intense darkness. The mother sips some hot water with lemon. The father, a little grappa. They say that being here is all they need, that even the air is different, that it cleanses. How lovely, they say, being together like this, away from everyone. First thing in the morning, I go to the chicken coop to gather eggs. They're warm and pale, filthy. I put a few in a bowl and bring them to the guests for breakfast. Normally, there's no one around, and I just leave them on the patio table. But then I notice through the sliding door that the girls are already awake. I see bags of cookies on the sofa, crumbs, a cereal box overturned on the coffee table. The girls are trying to swat the flies that buzz around the house in the morning. The older one is holding the fly swatter. The little sister, frustrated, complains that she's still waiting for her turn. She says she wants to swap them too. I put down the eggs and go back to our house. Then I knock on their door and lend the girls our fly swatter. That way they're both happy. I don't repeat the fact that it's better to kill the flies before you go to bed. It's clear that they're having fun, while the parents, in spite of the annoying flies and the girls' racket, continue sleeping. After two days, a predictable routine sets in. In the late morning, the father goes to the cafe in town to buy milk and the paper to get a second coffee. He pops over to the supermarket if need be. When he gets back, he goes running in the hills despite the humidity. One time, he comes home rattled after crossing paths with a sheepdog that blocked his way, even though, in the end, nothing happened. The mother does what I do. She sweeps the floor, cooks, washes dishes. At least once a day, she hangs up the laundry. Our clothes mingle and dry on a shared line. She tells her husband, clasping the laundry basket in her arms, how happy this makes her. Since they live in the city in a crowded apartment, she can never hang their clothes out in the open like this. After lunch, the father takes the girls to the beach and the mother stays home alone. She stretches out and smokes a cigarette, writing in her notebook with an air of concentration. One day back from the beach, the girls run around for hours trying to catch crickets that jump through the grass. They snatch them up. They put a few in a jar with little pieces of tomatoes stolen from their parents' salads. They turn them into pets, even naming them. The next day, the crickets die, suffocated in the jar, and the girls cry. They bury them under one of the plum trees and put some wildflowers on top. Another day, the father discovers that one of the flip-flops he's left outside is missing. I tell him that a fox probably took it. There's been one prowling around. I tell my father, who knows the habits and hideouts of all the animals around here, and he manages to find the shoe, along with a ball and a shopping bag abandoned by the previous family. I realize how much the guests like this rural, unchanging landscape, how much they appreciate every detail, how these things help them think, rest, dream. 
When the girls pick blackberries staining the pretty dresses they're wearing, the mother doesn't get mad at them. Instead, she laughs. She asks the father to take a picture and then throws the dresses in the wash. At the same time, I wonder what they know about the loneliness here. What do they know about the days always the same in our dilapidated cottage? The nights when the wind blows so hard the earth seems to shake, or when the sound of rain keeps me awake. The months we live alone among the hills, the horses, the insects, the birds that pass over the fields. Would they like the harsh quiet that reigns here all winter? On the last night, more cars arrive. Friends of the parents have been invited along with their children who run around on the meadow. A couple of people report that the traffic was light coming in from the city. The adults take a look around the house and walk in the garden at sunset. The table on the patio is already set. I hear everything as they eat. The laughter and chatter are, are louder tonight. The family relates all their mishaps in the country, the tomato eating crickets, the funeral under the plum tree, the sheepdog, the fox that carried off the flip flop. The mother says that being in touch with nature like this has been good for the girls. At a certain point, a cake comes out with candles, and I realize it's the father's birthday. He's turning 45. Everyone sings, and they slice the cake. My father and I finish up some overripe grapes. I'm about to clear the table when I hear a knock at the door. I see the girls, hesitant, out of breath. They give me a plate with two slices of cake on it, one for me and one for my father. They dash off before I can say thanks. We eat the cake while the guests talk about politics, trips, life in the city. Someone asks the mother where she got the cake. It came from a bakery in their neighborhood, she says, adding that one of the other guests brought it up. She mentions the name of the bakery, the piazza where it's situated. My father lays down his fork and lowers his head. His eyes are agitated when he looks at me. He gets up abruptly and then steps out to smoke a cigarette, unobserved. We used to live in the city too. My father sold flowers in that very piazza. My mother used to help. They spent their days next to each other in a small but pleasant stand, arranging bouquets that people took home to decorate their tables and terraces. New to this country, they learned the names of the flowers, rose, sunflower, carnation, daisy. They kept them, their stems submerged in rows of buckets. One night, three men showed up. My father was alone. My mother, pregnant with me at the time, was at home because he didn't want her to work at night. It was late. The other stores around the piazza were closed, and my father was about to lower his grate. One of the men asked him to open up again, saying that he was about to go and see his girlfriend. He wanted a nice bouquet. My father agreed that he'd make him one, even though the men were rude, a little drunk. When my father held up the bouquet, the man said that it was skimpy and asked him to make it bigger. My father added more flowers, an excessive number of them, until the man was satisfied. He wrapped paper around the bouquet, then he bound it up with colored ribbon tying a bow. He told him the price. The man pulled some money out of his wallet. It wasn't enough. And when my father refused to hand over the bouquet, the man told him that he was an idiot, that he didn't even know how to put together a nice bouquet for a beautiful girl. Then, together with the others, he started beating my father until his mouth filled with blood, until his front teeth were shattered. My father yelled, but at that hour, no one heard. They said, go back to wherever you came from. They took the bouquet and left him like that on the ground. My father went to the emergency room. He couldn't eat solid foods for a year. After I was born, when he saw me for the first time, he couldn't say a word. Ever since, he struggled to speak. He garbles his words as if he were an old man. He's ashamed to smile because of his missing teeth. My mother and I understand him, but others don't. They think, since he's a foreigner, that he doesn't speak the language. Sometimes they even think he's mute. When the pears and red apples that grow in the garden are ripe, we cut them into thin slices, almost transparent, so he can savor them. One of his compatriots told him about this job in this secluded place. He wasn't familiar with the countryside. He'd always lived in cities. He can live and work here without opening his mouth. He's not afraid of being attacked. He prefers to live among the animals, cultivating the land. He's become used to this untamed place that protects him. 
When he talks to me as he drives me to school, he always says the same thing, that he couldn't make anything of his life. All he wants me to do is study and finish school, go to college, and then go far away from them. The next day, late in the morning, the father starts to load the car. I see four people, tanned, even more closely knit. They don't want to leave. At breakfast, they say that they'd like to come back next year. Nearly all the guests say the same thing when they go. A few faithfully return, but for most of them, once is enough. Before heading out, the mother shows me the stuff in the fridge that they don't want to take back to the city. She tells me that she's grown quite fond of this house, that she already misses it. Maybe when she's feeling stressed or overwhelmed by work, she'll think of this place, the clean air, the hills, the clouds blazing at sunset. I wish the family safe travels and say goodbye. I stand there waiting until the car's out of sight. Then I start to prepare the house for the new family that's supposed to get here tomorrow. I make the beds, I tidy the room, the girls turned upside down. I sweep the flies they swatted. They've forgotten or left on purpose a few things they don't need, things I hold on to, pictures the girls drew, shells they picked up at the beach, the last drops of a perfumed shower gel, shopping lists in the faint small script that the mother used on other sheets of paper to write all about us. Jimba, thank you so much for that beautiful story. Um, I think it, it touches on so many of the, um, the topics that this conference is about and that we've talked about in some of the earlier panels. But um, first, I want to ask you just some questions about the story. Can you tell us how you came to write the story, if there was something that um, sort of sparked it in your mind, or you know, how, how you came to write it? I came to write it. Um, because I was living in Rome, and um, one of the lovely things about my life in Rome is that every day I end up speaking inevitably all three of the languages that I speak. Um, I speak Italian when I go out of the house. I speak English inside the house with my family, and I speak Bengali with um, many, many, um, people uh, from Bangladesh who uh, live in Rome, who work all over, uh, all over the place in Trastevere, which is the neighborhood we live in. Uh, they, they sell things in makeshift stalls on the street, um, everything from shoes and suitcases to bed sheets and tablecloths. They work in the markets. They peel the vegetables. Um, in the butcher shops. In any case, so they, they, they form part of, um, the, the Bangladeshi community forms part of my day-to-day my -day life um, in almost every establishment that I frequent. Um, and, uh, and, and I talk to them, you know, I ask them what, what they like, what they don't like about living in Rome. And, um, and you know, from the very beginning, I, I heard a lot of, um, troubling impressions, um, anecdotes. And, uh, and this grew out of, um, I mean, that, that moment at the end of the story, um, that, that violent act um, was, is based on something I heard one, one man tell me um, about, uh, he was he actually worked in the flower shop I used to go to all the time to buy flowers. This had happened to him in another neighborhood, not in in our neighborhood but um, and it was something I heard quite early on uh, in my life there and it stayed with me and then um, and then some years later, I was on vacation with my family in a place called Capalbio, um, which is about two hours north of Rome right over the border in Tuscany, um, but not the sort of Tuscany people think of 
most people think of um, um, a more kind of uh, Cape Cod-like Tuscany, if you will. Um, and we were there, and, um, and we were renting a friend's house. And I was very aware of the caretaker's daughter, who was a young girl, very small child at the time. She was very uh, curious about my, my kids and would pop out sometimes from their little house, um, venture out to say hello. And, and I spent most of the vacation thinking about her and wondering what her life would be like in 10 years. So the story um, was inspired by that. You mentioned the, um, you know, the, the, you know, one of the stories that, that worked its way into this piece you heard some years ago. Um, of course, stories like that, unfortunately, have happened all over the place and have happened for a long time. And I think we're starting to hear more and more stories of violence against immigrants, um, at least here in the US, especially now, but elsewhere as well as sort of um, right-wing parties have sort of started to assert themselves all over the place. Um, when I told people that I was going to get to speak with you today, and I said, you know, she's going to be reading the story that was in the New Yorker, um, many people got very excited because they had read the story. And um, in talking, you know, with friends and other writers, you know, many of them assume that the story took place in Italy because, which, because it mentions that it's translated from the Italian because, um, you know, you're known to live in Italy. But in the story itself, the location is sort of deliberately unspecified, as is the home, uh, the home nation of the narrator and her family. And the truth is that it really, it could almost take place anywhere, including even in the US. And I'm curious if, about your decision to not name um, the sort of the two central locations in the story, where it takes place, and then where the family itself is from. Mm -hmm. So I think that's such an interesting choice. Well, yeah, it is a choice, and it's something I've been choosing to do or not do um, uh, for some years now. I, I think all of my Italian writing uh, has been um, taking place in uh, an invented space, uh, if you will. Um, it was interesting because I asked my son, um, who's almost 16, um, uh, if he wanted to read the story, because he was sort of vaguely aware that it had come out. Um, I think he saw it, you know. <laughs> um, or heard me and my husband talking about it or something. Um, so I said, well, you know, if you want, you can read it. It's pretty short. Um, <laughs> and he said, sure, OK. And he read it. And, um, and I said, could you recognize where it took place? And he said, Wellfleet, Cape Cod, <laughs> where they actually, my kids and my husband are right now, and I'm going to join them tomorrow. Um, and it was, it is a place, we, we used to go there much more often. Um, it's a place we love very much and, and a place in which we feel a little bit like the family in that story. Um, and we have that, that kind of relationship with the place. I, I, I think the story is very much about how people, how a single place can be read in so many different ways and experienced in different ways, depending on who you are and, and the things we project onto places um, that aren't necessarily ours. Um, and, um, but the reason I don't want to name the place, to specify the place, even though, yes, it was inspired by this small town called Capalbio, which is in Italy, which is in this part of the planet Earth. And, you know, um, and, and there are some, some Italian Friends read it and say, ah, Capalbio, you know, and they, they know right away. And others aren't so sure. But I, I really um, feel very strongly right now about leaving the, the specificity uh, to, 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 just to leave it entirely open in terms of where the story is placed. And I think this is uh, probably um, my own desire to. Um, liberate myself from from certain um, from a certain weight I feel uh, in terms of being connected to specific geographical uh, and cultural um, points of reference yeah 
And I think in doing that also, it, like you said, it sort of allows other people to overlay their own sort of experience on it, like your son seeing Wellfleet in there, which is a place that I happen to know as well. And for other people too, I think, you know, to make, sort of make their own meaning out of the story, um, which leads us to sort of the larger questions of the conference. Um, in an interview with The New Yorker about this story, um, you mentioned that you, you do think of this as a political story. You know, they had, I think they had asked you, you know, do you see this as a political story or do you see it as something else? And you had a, a wonderful quote. You said, all my work is about identity, about belonging, and therefore all of my work may be read politically. And I love what you said about that sort of, um, that idea of sort of the point of view shift where um, I think a lot of times people will say that something is political and I'm curious about what your thoughts are about what, what political writing is. Do you think that, that there is such a thing as writing that isn't political? So this is a big question. <laughs> that is a big question. I mean, I, I, think, I think certainly most of my work can be looked at through that. I mean, I, I'm not writing it with any specific intent, um, message, anything like that, but I, but I think it's, it's, it would be naive to not think of that reality. I remember, you know, when I was growing up, um, my father, uh, so my family and I moved to, to Cambridge in 1969, and, um, and he would say uh, now and then, well, it's thanks to President Nixon that we're here. <laughs> and I remember growing up thinking, why is my dad saying that? Like, why, why is this even relevant? And Nixon's bad, and why, why do we have to talk about this? But then I realized what he was getting at, that, you know, it's all about laws. It's all about immigration laws. And, you know, it's all about these political realities. It's all about governments making decisions about, about you know, how to negotiate their borders. Um, and so, yes, as a result of that law in that moment and those policies in that time in that year, my father got the clearance to come with his wife and his daughter to the United States, and there they remained. Um, but I think for someone who's actually doing the border crossing, you never lose sight of that, um, no matter who's in charge in the mo at the moment, even if it's Richard Nixon, you know, you sort of have that sense of, that weird sense of, of, of gratitude that the doors opened for you. And it is, it is political. Yeah, I think it's, 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 what you're saying reminds me sort of that it's very difficult to separate sort of the, the context in which your work is being inspired or is taking place from sort of what the work itself is. And I don't know that that's even necessarily a thing that we, that we want to do. Um, one of the things that I find myself struggling with as a writer is sort of the, as you say, when people view your work through this sort of political lens um, of trying to figure out sort of what I, as a fiction writer, you know, I spend my day making up stories about people. So I'm, as a friend of mine said, I'm spending my day with imaginary people in imaginary places doing imaginary stuff. <laughs> and then... Um, it, but at the same time, I hope that the, the work that, you know, that I'm creating and that you're creating speaks to the world that we're in, right? And um, being in that sort of strange um, border area has been a thing that I'm learning to negotiate as a, a writer sort of starting out in this. Um, and curious about what you think the role of the writer is in, in sort of this, the current socio-political climate. You know, do we have a responsibility to, to directly and consciously try and, and talk about those issues in our work or off the page? Um, or is that really just part of the meaning that critics and readers should be bringing to our work? Is that sort of, you know, is that sort of above our pay grade, so to speak? I write to feel free, so I don't write for any, I don't write for any purpose yeah. to, to answer to anything um, other than a desire on my part. It's a very selfish uh, occupation. I will not lie about it. Um, if I'm talking to anybody, it's usually to a group of dead writers <laughs> who have guided me and taught me how to live. Um, I feel that that is where my energy mm -hmm. lies. Um, you produce the work, it's born, and it, and, it, and it has its own life, and it's received 
um, and there's really very little you can do about it. It's either read or it's ignored, it's understood, it's misunderstood, it's maligned, it's praised. It's read in all sorts of ways. And probably will be read um, in all sorts of different ways 10 yeah. years from now, 50 years from now. Of course. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think it's, it's foolish to try to, to write to, a, for, to, to, to solve anything, uh, to explain anything. Um, I, I think writing can, can and does uh, communicate great truths to, to people who read and read carefully and are searching um, as readers. And that is why literature speaks to me. But it's a very personal relationship um, that is, and my relationship to the writers I read is unlike that relationship between another person and those same writers, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone, we all have our different constellations. So, so that's, that's where I am as a, as a, as a, as a, as an artist. Um, uh, and, and, and then there's another conversation that happens yeah. that I'm not that I don't participate in and I have no interest in overseeing. Yeah, in some ways I think one of the paradoxes of being a writer and especially a fiction writer is that I think when I come to the page, I am not, as you say, I'm not coming in with an agenda or message that I want to write about. I'm not thinking, now I'm going to write a book that is going to teach people about this. I'm writing in some way because there's something in this story or in the characters that's intrigued me. But then when those stories, as you said, sort of they go out into the world and they get you know, interpreted, misinterpreted, um, you know, kind of translated in some way. Um, we heard in some of the morning panels for any of you who were here, um, we heard a little bit about sort of the power of narrative and the power of story, and it's something that I wanted to sort of bring up for our discussion. Um, Sarah Leah Whitson um, was talking, as she showed some videos, um, which they were using in the Middle East to try and um, work in, in Saudi Arabia to end the, uh, the guardianship system. Um, which men are, are assigned to be the guardians of, of women in their lives. And um, she talked about working with women in, in Saudi Arabia to kind of figure out what is the narrative of the story, what is the story that we want to show in the video that will resonate with the women that we're trying to talk to, or, and even the men that we're trying to talk to. Um, and Kari Hong uh, told us a little story at the end of her talk in which she mentioned um, that uh, her father said, you know, we're lucky to live in a country that um, you know, where we're allowed to disagree with the government because he knew what it had been like to live in a, a regime that didn't allow that kind of freedom. And um, it, this is not actually a question, I guess, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of interested in, in talking about that sort of position that writers find themselves in where we create these sort of texts and these narratives do have a lot of power um, to go out sort of beyond us and yet those aren't, that's not something we can control, and I'm not even sure it is something that we should control. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's yes. I, I think, I think you're 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 rightly sort of um, embellishing what I what I was trying to put forth. Um, um, you know, when I was talking earlier, just this idea of um, that there there are different spheres, right? It's different spheres of activity and. There's the writing, there's the reading, there's the perception, there's the life of the book over time, there's the, the relationship of the book with the world. The world is constantly shifting, um, the situation is constantly shifting, so the book has greater or, le or lesser um, resonance depending, or just different on, resonance, uh, yeah. uh, depending on who's reading it, when they're reading it, how they're reading it. Yeah. Um, I mean, just from a purely personal point of view, you know, Anna Karenina meant one thing to me when I read it presumptuously at 16. It meant something very different when I read it when I was breastfeeding my newborn daughter, mm -hmm. and it will mean something very different the next time I, I sit down to read it. Yeah. You know, I mean, because, because I'm not that, that same person. Yeah. Um, they, they, it's, it remains a point of reference, but you see it in different 
in, in a totally different way, and it speaks, it's telling you completely different things. And of yeah. course, yeah, I've had a similar experience with um, The Count of Monte Cristo, a favorite book of mine, and of course the text remains the same. And so when I read it, um, my sister was in college and she gave it to me, and I was an adolescent, and I was really taken with the adventure story, you know, at, at 12, and then I read it again at 15, and I was very taken with the romance in the book, um, and I thought it was very romantic. And then I got older and I started to see it as this sort of um, sort of morality story. And now I read it as this, this question of how much are you really allowed to play God? How much can you do that? You know, this um, and all of those things, obviously, those changes have happened in, in me, as you're saying, it has this different resonance depending on w the context in which you read it. Um, I think the one thing that writers, that we writers can and, and do have to really consider is sort of which stories we tell. Um, and in the story that you read, The Boundary, uh, the mother who comes on vacation is also a writer of some kind. We don't know exactly what she's doing when she's writing in her notebook, but we have the sense that she is maybe going to tell her version of this trip and her version of the, the story of the narrator and her father. But of course, she doesn't know the things that the narrator knows and the things that the narrator tells us about what happened to the father. Um, and if this mother tells the story, she's almost certainly going to leave out some really important context to the, to the story, at the very least. And it, it sort of, for me, raised the questions of, um, you know, who, who should tell the stories? Who's allowed to tell the stories? Um, I'm thinking about some of the panels from this morning where, um, you know, questions were raised about, well, if, you are, if we are coming from the West and we are talking to other parts of the world, is this sort of a narrative that we're imposing on them? Or in, to what degree do we allow them to tell their own stories? Um, and it's something that I find myself wrestling with in my writing. What, what stories am I allowed to tell? What stories am I going to be good at telling? I'm curious what you think about all of that. Well, I think the writer should have no identity whatsoever. Hmm. Do you think that's possible? I, I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get to that point. Yeah. Um, but, I think, but I think I've always been that way. Yeah. I think I, I've never had a, an identity. I've never understood what identity was. Yeah. Uh, and if I and as whenever I started to understand what it was, it, it it terrified me. And every time my life seems to take some sort of something more than a penciled in shape, I run away from it. Um, but I think this is crucial for for the artist, for the writer, especially the writer to always um, evade any kind of uh, precise identity because it is this, this um, that, that, that vacillating, uh, formless state in which you can shapeshift into anything or anyone at any time in any place um, that allows you to create and to create characters and to create a world that isn't yours and to to think your way, feel your way, understand your way into other, other hearts, other souls. Um, and so that is, that's how I felt as a, even as a young girl, I felt that. And I, and I think because I wasn't a writer then, because I was just a, a child, um, it was a little bit scary because I think, um, in some sense, we, we want identity because identity is like a home. It's like shelter. Mm -hmm. it, it, it provides you know, walls and a roof and a sense, a semblance of security, um, which is what home is, a semblance of security. Um, but I think that as I, w once I became a writer, that, that state, that, that state of being, um, uh, that stateless state of being, if you will, um, became uh, a, a, my instrument. Um, it's my only instrument, and and I think that is, um, you know, something that I, I I very carefully cultivate at this point, um, because I know that that is the only instrument that that allows me to work. Yeah. It's so interesting that you phrase it as sort of having no identity versus sort of having 
multiple identities. Um, I'm trying to think about whether those two things are flip sides of the same coin, or if there's a difference between sort of feeling that you are not rooted anywhere or feeling that you have multiple roots. I'm thinking of the conversation we had at, at lunch where you mentioned, you know, you feel like you've got a life in Italy and you've got a life here and you've got sort of many different lives in different places. I have many lives, but I don't have a, it's, it's, identity is a different thing. Yeah. Identity is a different thing that you, you feel or you don't, hmm. right? So, you know, my mother feels Indian, mm -hmm. right? Even right at this moment in her home in Rhode Island, she feels Indian. And nothing will make her not feel that. Yeah. But that's That's, that's identity. identity. Yeah. I don't have that. Yeah. I don't feel... I don't feel Indian, I don't feel American, I don't feel Italian, yeah. I don't feel English. I was just in London and people say, well, you must feel a little bit English. You know, you were born in London. How can I feel English? I mean, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, maybe it's just my own, my own inability to, to connect to, to identity, but I think I've, because of the way I was raised and the world in which I was raised and the worlds in which I was raised, I was, I was always suspicious of it. Mm -hmm. I was always suspicious of identity. Um, and, and now in my adult life, uh, again, I feel like I have to remain vigilant. Um, but maybe it's just a self-protective mechanism because I can say this, I can sit up here and say, well, I don't believe in identity, but I think I also feel I've suffered so much in my life for lacking an identity. Yeah. And it has been a, a source of anguish for me to lack, to be able to, to not be able to say, I'm this or I'm that. And it's that absence, that, 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 that absence of identity that I talk about um, a little bit in, in my last book, in, in, in other words, you know, where I talk about language. It's that, 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 that vacuum, that black space, that silence um, that, that was, a, you know, was a terrifying reality. So I think what I've constructed around that is, is my own, I'm sure it's my own de defense mechanism, as well as, you know, something I try to embrace as the key for my creativity. Mm -hmm. It's both things. It's so fascinating. I could feel like I could talk to you about this for another half an hour, but I think we're um, we're meant to move on to the audience questions. And so, um, are there are there question cards? Thank you. Um, all right. This is where I'm going to try to read your handwriting. Um, All right, so this, this is a question about the, um, you mentioned that the title of your story, um, in English it's The Boundary, but in Italian it's El Confine. El Confine. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, you know, it suggests, uh, not only, it's not only boundary, but it also suggests um, confinement. Um, and this question is, can you discuss the many sort of, you know, senses of confinement in our cultures, um, sort of in terms of who's, who's confined and who gets to do that in, in what ways sort of that maybe relates to the story? Well, boundaries are created to keep people confined, right? Um, in some sense to, you know, to demarcate. And um, so much of human civilization has been about um, this reality, negotiating this reality, fighting over this issue, uh, this these lines we draw. Um, but um, I mean, I think, I think it's, a, it's a rich metaphor. I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I haven't really thought about it that much. But I, I suppose, you know, as you say, as you mentioned, um, the mother character is, is the writer, right? And, and she's sort of me, you know. I was that mother in some sense, and I was also the little girl, of course. I'm everybody in the story. Um, but, but I think, of course, each of us is confined in our own reality. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point. And, um, and the writer writes to get out of one's reality. At least that's why I started writing, 
was to get out of my, my skin and my reality, um, partly because, of, because I was curious, partly because I didn't particularly like my reality, mm -hmm. uh, partly because it just felt um, exciting and different. Um, but, but, but I think in the end, we're, we're all, we each have our reality, our, our, our thoughts, our perceptions, our minds, and, and, and the, this is the boundary. You know, we are individual boundaries, you know, yeah. um, of, of uh, um, co incredibly complex, uh, unique individual boundaries. And so much of life and literature and our problems, our woes, <laughs> are about the, the inability to communicate openly and clearly, um, the inability to negotiate those boundaries. And I think my work has really been about that from the very beginning, looking at it in all sorts of, um, you know, with all sorts, in all sorts of um, variations um, yeah. on the theme. And that, that touches on um, one of the next questions. Um, is, could you say more about what you mean by saying you know, that you write to be free? And I think this is related to what you've just been talking about. Um, this person asked sort of what, what does that mean to you um, in terms of, of being free in your writing? Um, is, it, is it just as you said sort of the ways that you can communicate with each other sort of clearly? Or is it also about in some ways sort of um, being able to step outside of your own life, your own experience? What, is it, what does that mean to you when you say that you're writing to be free? It means I'm writing to feel free. It means that it, it's, it's... Sorry, whoever asked the question. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't mean to be... I don't mean to dismiss the question. It's a very, it's a very complex question, and I'm, I'm trying to write myself an answer. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, you know, one is in flight or, or not. Um, but I think I am someone who has been um, wary of, uh, of expectations handed to me and wanting to, uh, objecting to um, certain expectations. You mean expectations of what people sort of expected you would write about or what you would say about them and? Who I would be. Yeah. I mean, forget about writing. Yeah. Just as a human being, expectations on me for who I would be, how I would be, how I would live my life, how I should live my life, um, what I would do with my life. Um, I felt this keenly from a very young age. And, uh, and I think part of it was because I was raised by, by displaced people who had a very keen sense of identity. And, and so that creates a very charged environment in the family, uh, at least in my family, in terms of um, how I was expected to be mm -hmm. and what I was expected to be and who I was, I was expected to be all of those things with and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I felt incredibly you know, under intense forms of control. Um, not just, I'm not, this is not to say, oh, you know, uh, my parents wanted all of these things. It was, it was more than my mother and father. It was a sort of community. It was a, a world within a world. It was layers of expectations. It was expectations when I would go to Calcutta with my parents. It was expectations when I was in this country. It was expectations of people outside of my family. And, and ultimately, they were the expectations that I was bringing to the equation, mm -hmm. the worst of them all, because I wanted to somehow please absolutely everybody you know, in all um, of those disparate ways, in all ways, of the yeah. disparate worlds and ways, and um, and it really is a recipe for um, intense unhappiness and disaster. Yes. <laughs> um, so you know, I tried to find my, a way out of that. Yeah. And that's the freedom I seek. I seek the freedom from that weight and that obligation. Uh, the freedom to be, the freedom to be um, happy, and mm -hmm. and and um, which is you know, lightly said, but um, painfully gained. Yeah. 
This is a slightly later question. Um, someone would like to know who are the dead writers that you speak to when you have that conversation with, with the dead writers you mentioned? Well, it depends on the, the, grave of, the graves I'm going to visit on any particular day. Um, I, um, I was reading Kafka on the plane today. Um, um, but in general, for the past several years, I've, if, I've predominantly been reading Italian writers, um, most of them dead, not all. Um, and uh, I've been translating uh, a living author, uh, perhaps Italy's finest living author, Domenico Sarnone. Um, so, uh, but really, I mean, the constellations are, are vast as they are in real life, in the real sky. Um, so um, they're, they're, they're just, I mean, I'm old enough to be able to sort of say, well, those were the writers. I mean, I can sort of link every book to a, to a different group of writers, yeah. we can, shall I say. But this story, for example, um, I don't know what it comes out of. But certainly, um, I think probably um, the writer Agota Kristof uh, inspired this story, um, a Hungarian author who moves to Switzerland um, and uh, flees to Switzerland with her family and learns French and writes in French, wrote in French. She's no longer living. Um, and it was reading her a great discovery when I was you know, beginning my Italian journey, uh, a, a great point of reference for me um, to read her and to, to think about what she did and her example. Um, so this, this story was inspired by her. When you think of yourself as being in, you know, as talking to those writers, do you sort of talk to them in your head or do you see your work as in some ways being your conversation with them? I don't know if there's anything as conscious as that. I, I, I think reading, I mean, I think, I think reading for me is just a form of writing. Uh, no, that came out wrong. I think writing is a form of reading. I think writing is a form of reading for me. When I was, when I was young, when I was a little girl, I learned how to read around six or seven. And, um, and I, I, I couldn't read without copying what I was reading in some strange form almost simultaneously. Um, I don't know why I did that, but, I, but that's what I did, and that's how I started writing. So, um, so that's remained a constant in that if I read something deeply enough, which is, which is how we read when we're, when we're just learning how to read, right, because we don't know how to we're not used to it yet, and it's, it's such a revolution. It must be. Um, I mean, it is. It's such a revolution to be able to learn how to read. My god, it's like the best thing ever. Well, it's such a, and, a uh, my son is seven, and uh, he's, he taught himself to read quite early, but it was this kind of revelation to him, like you said, that there was somebody somewhere else at some other point in time had written down these words and had this idea, and that now this idea was in his head, was this sort of mind-blowing idea to him that in some ways he could, he could have their, you know, he could get some semblance of their ideas. Like you said, it's such a, um, a transformative thing. Yeah, I mean, I think for me the transformative experience was more just the, the pure solace, mm. the first solace of life was reading. And, and, and then I start to echo, right, what I'm reading. And so even now, um, I feel that that's what I'm doing somehow, across, I mean, in a very, in a less, I mean, mechanical way. Because when I was young, I would read, and I would, I would read something. I would read Little House on the Prairie, and I would, I would, then I would write this weird version of the same story, <laughs> right? Um, I did that also, actually. Yeah. I had, my, mother, <laughs> my mother recently found sketchbooks in which I had drawn and illustrated little stories. There's little Mary, and there's little Laura, Wagons, blonde, right. blue and pink, and yeah. <laughs> so, but I, but I think as one grows older, and I mean, if, and if you be, end up being a writer, then the, 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 that back and forth becomes much more complex and layered, and, and then there are influences that you're 
you know, either you're consciously channeling them or you're unconsciously channeling them. You're, you, you know, you, you pick things up, you're not aware. Um, you're not aware of the, all of the particles that are moving around in the room in any given moment. Are there contemporary or not undead, non, non-dead, alive <laughs> writers that you, that you have been reading over the, over the past few years? Well, as I said, the, um, Domenico Starnone, um, whose two novels I've recently translated, um, one is called Trick in, Itali uh, in English, sorry, and the other is Ties. Um, um, uh, I recently very much admired um, the novel by Neil Mukherjee, my friend who's here with me today, A State of Freedom. We had a wonderful conversation about that novel uh, not long ago in Princeton. Um, but in general, I don't read very much contemporary fiction. Um, and at this point, I don't really read fiction in English either. So uh, it's, it's a lot of 19th century uh, and 20th century Italian authors at the moment mm -hmm. who are feeding me. Um, along those lines, we have a couple of questions about um, translation. Um, someone says, can you talk a little bit about your experience of translating the story that you read? Um, I know that your book, in other words, you wrote in Italian and then someone else translated it, and this story you wrote and then translated yourself. Um, and following on that, someone wants to know, so when you translate from Italian to English, you know, did you edit substantially? Um, did you change it substantially? Sort of what was that process like for you? To translate this story? Yeah. Um, it was really weird. <laughs> it's a very weird thing to to, tra to try to translate myself. Um, it's very disorienting. I mean, it's a level of disorientation that is, um, it's like the final frontier in a way. Um, the other day with my family, we, we, we walked out on the breakwater at Provincetown, you know, that final little bit that I wrote about many years ago in the namesake, um, the novel I'm convinced I presented in this room. Um, in any case, um, and as I was walking this time with my family, uh, my kids now racing ahead of their old parents, my son coming back saying, can you speed it up, guys? We've reached the end. And anyway. Um, but I was going slowly, uh, partly because I was reflecting on sort of, you know, I mean, it was in Proven uh, Provincetown, sorry, uh, 20 years ago that I really felt born as a writer, fully born in a kind of definitive way, in, in a way that I nev never subsequently questioned, because until I turned, until that experience, I was 30 years old, and everything, all of the sort of writing activity before then, I was you know, it was all in pencil, like I was ready to erase everything. Um, not literally the words so much as just the, the, the presumption. Um, and after that, after that, those seven months in Provincetown, something happened and it, I felt that it was ink and not pencil, that I was ink and no longer pencil. Um, in any case, I was walking out across the breakwater and I was thinking, well, 20 years ago, I started writing seriously in English. And then 15 years after that, I moved to, to Italy and I started writing in a new language. And then a couple of years ago, I started translating out of Italian the work of somebody else into English. And now I'm writing in Italian and translating myself out of Italian. <laughs> and I thought, I think that is that final lighthouse that you get to, and then you just can't go anywhere else. <laughs> um, I think I've gotten to that, to that point. Um, so translating myself is that, it, it is quite, it is arduous and bewildering for me. Um, I've. I've just finished a short novel in Italian that I'm thinking of translating, and I mean, I'm sort of dreading it, you know, um, because it's going to be very hard. Do you prefer, though, to translate it yourself rather than to turn it over to I, someone else? I, I feel completely sort of torn up about it because I, on the one hand, I don't want anybody else to translate it. And on the other hand, 
I don't really want, want to translate it either. <laughs> um, but I have to. I have to figure out something. I, I think maybe once I once I get into it, into the room with the with the with the Italian version, maybe it will be okay. I mean, this story was sort of a, an experiment. One day I was swimming in the pool and I thought, well, it's only ten pages. You know, how how hard can it be? And it was hard. It was hard. But I think what made it easier was that I had a lot of time. This was something I wrote so long ago now. Um, that it's almost like, I mean, once I write something, after I write something, and if enough time goes by, I really, I completely forget about it, and it just, you know, it could be written by anybody. I imagine that would make it a little bit easier in some ways to translate it, because there's some space. Yeah, so once, once it sort of hardens like that, and I don't really connect, I'm not connected to it anymore, it, it might be easier. I mean, the problem with this novel is that I, I, I just sort of, you know, finished it up, and it's still, it's the, the, the spirit of it is still kind of hovering, and I, I don't know if it's the right time to immediately translate it back into English, but then I feel this horrible, this horrible expectation and, and people saying, well, when is it going to be translated? Because, of course, nobody can read it <laughs> if I don't translate it. I mean, nobody other than Italians. Yeah. And, and it's very interesting. To, to be performing this experiment and to, to, to be living, to be really living the reality of how colossally dominant the English language is in our world and to just realize it and to, 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 to experience it as a, as a writer, to experience what it means to write a story in Italian in, in you know, Grande Italia, which is no longer even in publication, and to know that 10 people read it, and that's only because I told 10 people in Rome, <laughs> guess what, I have this story, and I made photocopies and shared it with them. Yeah. The way I used to, when I used to live in Boston all the years, those years ago, and my first, very first short story was published in the Harvard Review, and I was so ecstatic, and three people read it, and three more people read it because I made photocopies and yeah. I gave them <laughs> to them. Um, I'm back in that place. As a, as a writer in Italian. Yeah. Um, and then it comes out in The New Yorker, and it has a totally different life, a totally different set of muscles and capacity to, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, there's no basis of comparison. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's just absurd, you know. Um, uh, it's staggering. It's mind-boggling. Um, but it does sound like it's important to you too that the story does reach this larger audience. That it, you know, I, I translated this story totally, sort of randomly. Literally, I was swimming in the pool one day in Princeton, thinking, you know, let me just see what it's like. I wasn't really thinking about publishing the story in English in that sense. I mean, it, it just seemed like a story I, I wrote, a kind of discreet piece of work, mm -hmm. um, and I had forgotten about it. And then I thought, oh, let me see what happens. And then, um, and then uh, my agent said, you know, what's going on back there? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I have this little thing. I don't know. And um, and the New Yorker kindly published it. But I wasn't thinking about it in that way. I mean, I, I think that's another thing I'm trying to sort of liberate myself from. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe I'm just completely crazy at this point, but. But, but just the, the whole machinery of, of publishing, editing, I, I don't know, I'm questioning everything. Well, and that, and that I think all those mechanisms are very separate from the sort of the act of creation and the artistic side of it. Um, this may be a difficult question f for you to answer, but you might be one of the few people who can answer it because you can read in Italian and in English. I'm curious if the responses were different, if the story was read differently in Italy than it has been read over here in The New Yorker. Not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of sort of meaning or import or the meanings that people are putting onto it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think the story is is um, as you say. I mean, I, it could sort of take place anywhere, and it talks about a very um, you know, unfortunately, rather widespread. Um, 
problem uh, phenomenon in our world about, of, uh, regarding intolerance and migration and, um, and attitudes toward uh, people who are different and feeling uh, out of place and belonging or not belonging. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think immigration is, is one thing in the Italian context and is a different thing in, in the context of the United States or, or in the UK, for example. There are different places with different history, different reality, and so forth. Um, but um, I mean, I, I, think, I think for the, for the, I think I'm read differently by Italians in Italian and I'm read differently as opposed to people who know me, you know, the Jhumpa Lahiri who wrote in English and was born as an English language writer. I think, you know, for, for some of those readers, you know, this story comes as a bit of a, what happened to her, mm -hmm. you know? So some people have said, well, but your other stories were, were like this, and they were talking about those kinds of things, and they sounded more like that. Which goes back to that question of expectations of what people expect you to be. So, so, so in English, you know, there's a little bit more of the before and after comparison conversation more, whereas I think in the Italian context, um, Italians are more um, just sort of. Uh, benevolently curious about what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, and and they're um, they're sort of they're 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 equally um, incredulous, but in a more benevolent way. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> I think in in the American context, I'm now in a phase where I'm 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 aware that what I'm doing is 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 odd and. Uh, um, not the expected, and and I've um, I have to tolerate much more of a sort of mixed mixed um, reviews, as it were. I don't read my reviews, but a mixed, you know, sense of a, a, you know um, people who just don't like this, uh, people don't like what I'm doing, people are very intolerant, um, people just want me to go back to the old old thing and the old ways, um, don't like the, this experimentation. Um, feel, you know, they say things um, um, to my face about it. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think it's all part of um, this quest to evade the idea of identity, even a writerly identity, which can be quite problematic, uh, which I think is problematic. Again, I think the artist has to shun identity. Um, uh, at all costs. Well, it's fascinating to read the story and see your new direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.